Good morning and a very warm welcome to you at the Oval in London. An exciting day because today we've got Simon Barr with us who's the public sector sales manager for Daimler Fleet Management. Simon, Daimler. We all think we know who Daimler are. Mm -hmm. DFM, tell us a bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, I think everyone thinks of Daimler as being Mercedes-Benz, John, and, and actually the message we put across is that Daimler fleet management is the multi-mark element of uh, what Daimler try and install within the UK and throughout the whole of Europe. So we're brand agnostic. Uh, we will lease any type of car, any type of van, okay. not just Mercedes-Benz. And more importantly, I think we take a very consultative approach to the way that we go out to market. We're looking to help fleets do the right thing. And I think that's part of what we're here today to discuss. Um, are electric vehicles right? Should you be looking at alternative fuels? And how do you implement mobility uh, projects throughout your fleet? So it's not just about the leasing element, it's a consultative element and uh, a little bit of help along the way from DFM, I think is always welcome from our customers. <laughs> because we've got a very quickly changing, a dynamic environment at the moment where legislation and protesters, let's be honest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are bringing to the fore that what we currently do with our fleets mm -hmm. isn't good enough. Right. Are you seeing much of a, a knock at your door saying, can you help us to move? I think, I think dy dynamic's a word. It, it's changing so quickly. And over the past year, 18 months, we've seen pressure, I think, in a very positive way put on fleet managers and the motors industry as a whole. So yes, we are getting people coming to us. Uh, they're asking us uh, to look at a holistic project whereby the whole of their fleet and the way they move things and move people are taken into account. It's not easy, but I think there's some very good places to start initially, and that's what Daimler Fleet Management always try and instill on our, on our customers. Start with some of the easy points that you can make a real difference with. So, so yeah, people are being proactive and coming to us. That's great. We're taking messages out as well, hence the fact we're here today. So uh, it's a good time to be involved in, in, in thinking about how dynamic this, this marketplace mm. is. It's dynamic and it's also a, a, a huge problem potentially for fleets who have multiple hundreds or thousands of vehicles. And I suppose having a trusted friend mm -hmm. is one of the best ways you can tackle this problem. Almost eating the elephant, bite-sized chunks That's of a, a good, project. Good way of putting it. It's a very good way of putting it because if you look at four or five years down the line, it feels impossible to reach some of the targets that we're going to be looking at later. And you don't want to be running a marathon if you've never never been out you know, jogging before. You need to do a step-by-step -step approach. And sharing of information, and perhaps we need to be better at that within our industry as a whole. What's worked for us well, what hasn't worked for us, Let's share that with colleagues, let's share that with other, other partners so that not everybody goes through the pain. And I think that's part of what we do at DFM. We're lucky in the sense that although we're a, 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 you know, a brand agnostic lease company, we are part of a big OEM group, so there's lessons learned and uh, no one needs to have um, a rocky road to zero emissions. Mm -hmm. It, it can be smoothed out and um, there's always help around the corner. And you talked about fitness there, you touched mm -hmm. on it, and a fitter fleet yep. is kind of where you're aiming towards. We recognise that fleets have a job to do, mm -hmm. but they don't all have to be uh, highly polluting old vehicles. By learning about how your fleet operates through telemetry and analysis, you can pick the right vehicles for your job. Because the number one priority for any business, surely, is getting the job done. Getting the job done, absolutely. Keeping drivers on the road, moving uh, products from A to B. And, and, and you're spot on because the ergonomic routine of vehicles is crucial. And understanding what they do, where they go, um, are they going into clean air zones? Uh, do the drivers actually need to make that journey? Is there an alternative method of getting a driver or, or a product from A to B? Mm. So all of these questions are out there. And um, I think if you try and boil the ocean, it makes the task too <laughs> difficult. Like you say, bite-sized chunks, take the low-hanging fruit initially and, and get some quick wins on board. Yeah. And then people will begin to embrace any new project with that drive to zero emissions. It, it reminds me a little bit, and, and it's not obvious from my, my stature, but it reminds me a bit of when I used to go to the gym and mm -hmm. had a, like a personal trainer. Right. If I wanted to run a marathon today, I couldn't do it. Yes. Yeah. But if I wanted to run to the end of the street, or if I wanted to spend five minutes on a treadmill, they would hold my hand to help me down that path to fitness. Yeah. 
that's the kind of thing you're doing, isn't that's it? That's exactly what we're trying to instill in, in, in people, the notion of fitness is something that's a long road mm. and, and you get fitter gradually. And so again, it's going back to stages. And I think you manage the stages of your fitness, of your fleet fitness, according to legislation, according to fiscal ability to do that, and according to what's on the market as well. So these steps, as you say, whether they're in the gym or out on the road, uh, they're, they're not something you need to do immediately. We, we see that in sport all the time. Mm, you know, the British Olympic teams, the cycling team, they have small targets which give quick wins, but the long-term benefit, absolutely mm. visible in the sense that ultimately, Gold medals are flooding in there. So why can't you do that with your fleet? Small steps to fitness, it, it, it will work. And the importance of having the right trainer mm -hmm. is key to any fitness program because you have to want to work with these people. And that's where Daimler really are very strong because the people you have are committed to ensuring that those fleets are as fit as possible. Yeah. Do, do you know what, John? We like working with people who want to work with us. And I think that's absolutely critical. You know, you have to have a trainer that understands your needs and your requirements and, and, and your psyche and what, what your actual, in, in fleet terms, your fleet consists of. Yeah. And if people want to work with us, we embrace that because then you get people buying into the message that we try and help them with. And that permeates through anybody, um, uh, you know, any, any corporate body, any public sector body. It, it means that you have stakeholders that join you in that journey. Yes. And it can be a long road, but that's great. You want more people on board sooner. And, and, and you know what it's like if you're in the gym and you have people encouraging you and helping you, you get fit quicker. Mm. But each individual is an individual and a training plan for me mm -hmm. will be different to a training plan for you. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that with each fleet that you deal with, the uh, answers, the solutions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are different for each fleet and actually you kind of provide a bespoke service? It's completely bespoke. I don't think I've ever done an analysis on a fleet where the, the message and the, the advice that we give has been the same. Every single fleet is different and every single fleet manager's requirements are different because of the factors that, that are um, underpinning the way the fleet operates and the conditions in which they operate. So yes, it, it is bespoke and that actually means a bit of input initially, well I'd say a lot of input if I'm going to be <laughs> frank, in terms of tell me what your fleet does, Yes. how does it operate, what's good, what's not so good, where would you like to improve? If you get that initial work done, we can come up with a bespoke package that is the first step to what I'd call ultimate fleet fitness. Yeah, absolutely. Right, now, we're going to go to a pre-prepared presentation for you now, which sets out precisely how DFM take you on that fitness journey from first contact, the flabby fleet, right through to the fit fleet. Let's watch the presentation together and questions can come in after that. Welcome to the first of Daimler Fleet Management's webinars aimed at helping you achieve a greener fleet in the future. And what I'd like to run through today will, I hope, be the catalyst for three aims. The first one, a short-term aim, to go back and really think about some easy wins to make your fleets greener. And those will then lead on to a medium-term project that I think will see you, over the next six to 12 months, really begin to evaluate what you can do with your current fleet vehicles to make them cleaner and perhaps to electrify them 100%. And then finally, Look at a long-term strategy, which will take you through the next two, three years so that you're staying ahead of legislation and keeping up with all of the exciting changes that the manufacturers are soon to bring to the electric and green vehicle market. I remember attending a fleet management conference six years ago when I was on the panel talking about electric vehicles. And I was asked the question, when will I definitely know the time is right for me to move my current fleet of internal combustion engine, whether they were petrol or diesel engines, across to purely electric? Six years ago, that was a difficult question to answer due to a number of reasons, and the biggest one was choice in the market. Now, if somebody was to ask that to me today, I wouldn't hesitate to say that now is the time, and there's a number of reasons for that. Legislation has meant that if you haven't already thought about moving to electric, you are, in all honesty, a little bit behind the curve, and you need to start thinking about what you can do to keep up and stay ahead of legislation. The choice from manufacturers now is infinitely greater than it was six years ago, both in terms of cars and vans, and also the range that these vehicles can achieve on a single charge. The infrastructure is now at a point where we have mixed modes of charging from rapid charge all the way through to standard charge, so it's a lot easier than it has ever been. And if there's any HR people watching in that look after their fleets, it's also an emotive issue now as well with your drivers. The whole environmental issue is very much on the agenda from a worldwide perspective, and the UK government is leading the way here. So we have a number of factors that mean that now more than ever, it really is time to think about 
not just for cleaning up of your fleet, but the potential to change over to electric or alternative sources and really stay ahead of all of the factors that are influencing the UK fleet market that just weren't there six years ago. So the phrase that everyone's talking about at the moment is the road to zero emissions. And I think that one of the interesting things here is that government is really driving this path. And at the moment, it might seem that we've been shoehorned into thinking about electric vehicles when perhaps we aren't ready to. As I mentioned previously, I think now is the right time. And I think we have to look at governmental aims to realise that this ambitious plan that they're putting forward is actually going to come and influence our decisions perhaps a lot sooner than we thought, and perhaps in some cases sooner than we're actually ready for. So let's have a look at some of the short-term aims that the government have put in place recently that I think will help you actually have some of those quick wins with your fleet. Because if these points that are on this slide aren't really obvious to you now, then again, I'd implore you to become very familiar with them quite quickly because there's a number of initiatives out there that can help you to really look at replacing uh, diesel and petrol engines with pure electric vehicles. There's government grants, there's infrastructure grants, and I think more to the point, there's a way of really evaluating which of your vehicles are no-brainers in terms of moving over to pure electric. I don't advocate uh, the, the, the drive to replacing fleets with 100% electric vehicles. Some vehicles just won't be suited to pure electric. But what you can do is have a look at the low-hanging fruit, those vehicles that really don't need to be either petrol or diesel and can be quite adequately replaced by electric and will end up saving you money in the long term and, of course, lowering your CO2 footprint as well. Now, the government hasn't just done this all on their own initiative. We're fortunate that the manufacturers are also staying one step ahead of required legislation. And that ultimately is where I think you need to start. Talk to your local dealer groups or talk to your manufacturer contacts and ask them what is available. Ask for a demo and ask them if they can substantiate the cost of an electric vehicle versus the cost of a diesel or petrol vehicle. And I think you'll find that you'll be surprised because the actual whole life running costs of electric over a standard ICE engine are surprisingly beneficial. So let's have a look at some of the more long-term governmental plans and you'll see from this timeline that ultimately the road to zero emissions is a very ambitious one and most notably 2050 means that diesel and petrol vehicles are no longer on UK roads and that's quite a bold statement to make. But I think even bolder is the notion that by 2030 more than 50% of new cars and 40% of new van sales are going to be ultra low emission vehicles. And you'll see there they're not saying pure electric, it's ultra low. And I think that's important from an LCV angle because they're different to cars. Obviously they carry heavier loads, they quite often move bigger distances and they have different job functions. So I think the government, although being ambitious, is realistic. And one of the things that we also have to bear in mind is that there's a little bit of stick involved in getting the UK fleet and car and van market to reach these targets, but there's a lot of carrot as well. And that's something to bear in mind because it's the carrot element that I think you need to take away from a medium term planning point of view to work out how you can really maximize the potential to help you to run a cost effective greener fleet because at the end of the day, a lot of fleet managers will be going to the finance department and saying, I want to move to lower emission vehicles. And the question they'll be asked is, how much is it going to cost me? And not many businesses these days will be able to substantiate a greener fleet at a much higher cost to run. So that 50% of new cars needs to be backed up by the government actually helping fleet managers and drivers and fleet decision makers to make a fiscal choice as well as a greener choice. So if the fiscal benefits of thinking about changing to an electric or hybrid fleet weren't enough. There's now a number of legislative changes which are acting as a bit of carrot and a bit of stick to further increase the pressure, I think, in a positive way on fleet managers to think about making changes. One of those is manufacturer based and it's come with the release of new WLTP figures um, to really give us an accurate and more realistic figure now regarding proper CO2 emissions and miles per gallon. And although some vehicles that perhaps would have fitted into bandings are now in a higher CO2 grade, I do think that WLTP has given us a really positive reason to examine the whole of our fleet in terms of a carbon footprint and make changes that are going to be beneficial because WLTP now can actually give you a proper way of assessing the whole life cost on a pence per mile basis of your fleet. And the stick element really comes with the clean air zones being introduced. London's leading the way here. Uh, it's not going to get any cheaper to take vehicles into London that aren't at the very least Euro 6 compliant and other major cities are going to follow soon. That's without a shadow of a doubt. So if you have vehicles going into clean air zones, you really need to think about the added cost that the, these charges are going to put on your fleet on a day-to-day -day basis when uh, looking at whole life costs across all of your fleet.
So introducing more electric vehicles onto the UK roads is obviously going to be a key aim for the UK government to achieve their aims in the road to zero. And if you look at this slide, you'll understand why six years ago I was really struggling to answer the query from a fleet manager when they asked, should I be looking at EVs now or if not now? when because only one in 900 new vehicles coming out were pure electric vehicles charging points were few and far between and there just weren't many electric vehicles around and more to the point the reputation of electric vehicles was one that had been dominated by range anxiety and people just being unaware of the new technology and perhaps how good it could be today however 220,000 electric vehicles on uk roads means that now one in 50 car sales are for pure electric vehicles and the manufacturers have come to the party with a whole host of choices not just in terms of small electric vehicles that are city runners, but larger SUVs. We're seeing all major manufacturers look at bringing pure electric vehicles into their portfolio, and the charging points are a lot more accessible. Five years' time, again, to achieve those targets, the government has to be at one in ten, and the manufacturers are again stepping up to the plate with new model launches planned. 2020 is going to be a fantastic year for new launches into the UK vehicle market from a purely electric point of view, and as 2021-22 comes, we're going to see an ever-burgeoning portfolio of vehicles for you to choose from when it comes to looking at pure electric. And again, the government helping us to make the right decisions by promising that there'll be 100,000 UK public charging points on our roads by 2024. So I think the fleet managers are now perfectly justified in asking the question, what does it mean to me and my fleet? And the answer to that is that there are two aims, one of it, which is a short-term aim to keep up with legislation. And the second one is future proofing so that your fleet really is ahead of the game uh, in terms of staying one step ahead of manufacturer changes and any further legislation that's going to come in. From a short term point of view, there are quick wins that you can look at. For example, if your vehicles, LCVs especially, are going into London, into the clean air zone and they're Euro 5, you need to get them changed because from a fiscal point of view, that's going to cost you money and you just aren't keeping up with the legislative changes that are impacting on us at the moment. From a more long-term point of view, you should be speaking to your manufacturer contact and your lease company contact, asking them to help you to future-proof your fleet because you want to be staying ahead of the curve, staying ahead of legislation and making sure that the plans and fleet policies that you implement are going to future-proof your fleet so that you can be proactive in the way that you plan which vehicles you bring onto fleet in the future rather than having to be reactive. So if you're going to put your current fleet through a stringent physical workout, how will it measure up? Is it fit enough only to be in line with what's required today in terms of CO2 emissions? How does it stack up in terms of being healthy in 12 months time? And is it going to be able to stay one step ahead of all the required changes in three to four years? I think here we're now moving on to the longer term gains and the longer term planning that's going to be required. And there's some quick takeaways, but also some fairly stringent policies that you could be putting in place that I'd like to touch on now. Well, I think the first part of any sensible fleet evaluation is to get your mindset as a fleet manager right about exactly where you want to take your fleet into the future. And my advice is, is not to try and bore the ocean and change everything immediately. As I mentioned previously, I don't think that pure electric vehicles are a silver bullet for every fleet solution. And that's perhaps something to start with. Again, I've mentioned about the low-hanging fruit, about those vehicles that are instantly identifiable as being moved over to purely electric. And that's a great way to start. No one's going to ask somebody that runs seven minute miles to run four minute miles within two or three months. It's not possible. So no one expects a fleet to make a transition from very practical and, and well-run diesel engines into pure electric. We have to actually look at the slow, slower, smaller wins to actually get the larger long-term gains. So a realistic evaluation of where your fleet is now, that's a key first step. I'm a big fan of the carrot rather than the stick when it comes to introducing electric vehicles onto your fleet and you can have some fun doing this first of all you can canvas drivers that are genuinely interested in testing and feeding back information about electric vehicles and there will be enough of these for you to be able to run a really strong demo program with the help of manufacturers and your fleet and leasing company and to get those drivers to really put them through their paces either in their work so that the, the vehicles are being tested to see if they comply with the urban ergonomic routine and even let the drivers take cars home for the weekend and uh, find out what the family thinks about being in an electric vehicle and whether the younger members of the family lobby mum or dad to actually get one of these for next time that their company car is up for renewal. And incentivise people as well. Incentivise people in terms of good driving standards currently in their vehicle but also the way that they 
behave with new vehicles if it's hybrids coming in. Let's find out which of your drivers can get the most miles per gallon. And a small incentive programme, just in terms of pinpointing some of the, the key performers, will always help in terms of spreading the news about how these vehicles have been looked at, tested, and some of the success stories that are coming out of uh, the new hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles that you're trialling. And think about the fiscal benefits as well in terms of selling those internally because vehicles that don't run on internal combustion engines are ultimately a lot cheaper to maintain. There's less moving parts and it might mean that vehicle uptime is considerably better than what you're achieving now. That's a bit more of a long-term plan, as I'd mentioned previously. That's one to note because ultimately, once you've gone through a full lease cycle or a vehicle cycle, you'll be able to actively demonstrate that the maintenance costs on electric vehicles are considerably lower than their diesel or petrol equivalents. And technology now is really there to help us to do an evaluation of what can and what cannot be changed on your fleet. Telematic systems, which can be provided by your leasing company, will actually be able to evaluate, again, those vehicles that can be changed, those vehicles that are doing the right type of miles per day um, for the choice of electric to be one that just has to be considered and thought about, and also those that are marginal as well, where perhaps a hybrid low emission vehicle might be more suitable. And then introduce policy changes slowly but surely within the company. Encourage your drivers to have a look at being a lot more efficient about the way they actually drive a vehicle, not just from a fuel consumption point of view, but planning ahead, looking at journeys, avoiding unnecessary loads in the back of light commercial vehicles, um, cutting down on drag by taking things like uh, top boxes off cars if they've come back from holiday, and generally just thinking ahead in terms of I need to get from A to B, and how can I do it in the most efficient, cost-effective and fuel-efficient manner. Winning the hearts and minds of your employees will always help as you look to introduce new fuel efficient vehicles onto fleet. There will always be drivers that are more than willing to move to electric and want to move to electric, but some of them might resist, some of them might not feel comfortable with those vehicles, and some of them might feel as though they just aren't right for the type of journeys and travelling that they do. So I think this is where the carrot comes in. Um, you can also look at some policies whereby CO2 thresholds are quite simply lowered because of WLTP tests in the new vehicles that have come onto the market and there there's an element of stick in the sense that you might need to sell a change of fleet choice to your drivers but ultimately the benefits that go behind that both from a personal tax point of view and a fuel saving and a more environmentally friendly point of view win out over your previous fleet policy and then if you cannot avoid driving diesel vehicles because of the nature of the job that's required for a van or for a car, then think about offsetting programs, um, buy some trees or talk to a local council about what can be done to offset some of your CO2 against initiatives that they might have. There's plenty of ways of doing this and the more creative you are, often the easier it is to open this type of door. An essential challenge for fleet managers is to begin to look at electric vehicles and low emission vehicles in terms of their whole life costs on a pence per mile basis. This is more of a challenge, it's a long term project that I would advise you get your manufacturer contacts and your fleet and leasing company that you use involved in this and challenge them to show that although electric vehicles might look more expensive on paper to either buy or lease in reality and in the long term they're considerably cheaper to run and I think that if this is a task that is daunting for you then don't let it sit by the side of your desk and, and, and just lie fallow talk to your leasing company and challenge them to actually help you to justify internally that electric vehicles need to be introduced because they are ultimately going to be cheaper to run. That will make finance uh, sit up and take notice. I think it will start to open doors internally and then if that is conveyed to drivers uh, internally within your company you're going to find that actually uh, you're pushing again against open doors and the introduction of low emission vehicles is going to be a lot easier um, than just trying to justify it from it costs me X to introduce and that's already dearer than what I'm currently running. So whole life cost, a fundamental focus point and a long-term plan to take away to make sure your fleet is fitter in the future than it is now. I think that the marketplace for electric vehicles is going to change the way that we analyse our current fleets. Some of those manufacturers that are popular now probably won't be as popular in the future and already we're seeing some really exciting electric vehicles come on from manufacturers that perhaps haven't dominated fleet choice for example and I think that it's down to you to actually talk to your employees about the type of vehicles that they now want on fleet. Gone are the days where better discounts were readily available if you stuck to one or two manufacturers. 
the market is very, very competitive on electric vehicles, and I think it gives you a great opportunity to really put out some feelers to manufacturer suppliers and ask them to come up with um, a plan that suits your fleet currently, but also a plan that is going to put your fleet five years down the line into the the area whereby they really have future proof them on your behalf and your drivers are satisfied, your finance director is satisfied, and most of all, you know that you've done whatever you can to stay one step ahead of uh, what is going to be, as we've looked at, tougher, tougher targets from the government in terms of compliance with CO2 emissions. The warranties are there from the manufacturers and the networks are good for electric vehicles. So I think that what has traditionally been seen as key makes and models from manufacturers of diesel and petrol engines could well change. And you might find that with pressure from your employees internally, these changes are something that you can introduce naturally. And remember that introducing electric and low emission vehicles to your fleet isn't just about lowering CO2 emissions. It should really be lowering costs on the bottom line for you to run your fleet as well. Maximise the government grants that are out there, have a look at manufacturer discounts as they introduce new models, and talk to your drivers about the type of journeys they do and try and forecast how much additional costs are going to be incurred because they're driving in and out of uh, CAZs if they're racking up an extra 10, 20 pounds per day because they're in and out of these clean air zones. You do need to factor that into the whole life cost running of your current fleet now. And then finally, I'm back to a question that I get asked on a regular basis these days. Should I buy my electric vehicle or low emission vehicle or should I lease it? And my answer to that is that we can give a fairly black and white pence per mile analysis to you based on what it costs you to run an outright purchase electric vehicle or to lease one. And I challenge your lease company to help you do that and talk to the manufacturers about uh, the best way to evaluate this. Obviously, it's horses for courses. If you have um, cash flow uh, to buy electric vehicles, you might well decide to do that and uh, help you to adopt new technology but not get left behind in the future when that electric vehicle technology is superseded. So there's some good shorter term lease options around on electric vehicles. And manufacturers, I think, will encourage lease companies to be looking at perhaps two-year options on contract hire, whereas at the moment you might take three or four, and that's because they're aware of the fact that their R&D departments, research and development is soon to launch a model that's perhaps even better than the new one that's come out onto the market. So have a think about the future. Um, talk to your lease company about flexible lease products that they can offer on electric vehicles, and do a proper analysis about how much is it costing me to own that vehicle versus to lease it over a shorter lease period. So that's it from Daimler Fleet Management in terms of us helping you to evaluate whether your fleet is EV fit now or how EV fit you want your fleet to be in the future. Uh, it's not a daunting task. There's some quick wins, as I've mentioned, but Daimler Fleet Management are there to help. So do speak to one of our electric vehicle advisors if you want to really go into more detail on anything that we've touched on today. There's some great advice um, from our Fleet Fit Guide, and you can visit our special electric vehicle part of the website. Thank you. So whilst you've been watching that, we've had heaps of questions coming in online and we're gonna to get to a few of those in just a second, but we're gonna start with one of mine. And that question is, Simon, that we know that there is government support for infrastructure being put in. There are grants available. Do DFM think that it's right that government fund that infrastructure or should industry bear some of the burden of the cost, if you like, of that infrastructure provision? Well, I think the benefits will speak for themselves ultimately. And I think with that in mind, if you're making savings, then it should be down to industry to bear the cost as well. I think the government's actually done a lot in terms of putting infrastructure in place initially. I think there needs to be more still, but it's, it's, it's not a bottomless pit of money. That's, that's the obvious point there. And I think when the benefits are really an analyzed in the long term, you'll see that the fleet is gonna be cheaper to run. It, it's gonna be more economic, uh, economically friendly for the driver and to you as a company, whether it's public sector or corporate. So, I'll be frank, why, why shouldn't some of the costs be borne? Absolutely, because some of the savings mm -hmm. goes directly straight back into the business. Straight into the business and, and onto the bottom line, ultimately. Yeah. So that's, ring-fencing that saving means that that can be an investment in future savings. It's almost um, spend to save. Well, that's part, that's part of the analysis that we do, because you look at how much you're saving on some vehicles. I mentioned the low-hanging fruit and the obvious ones that can make that transition to electric, those savings can then be put across to some of the vehicles that are borderline Indeed. or can be put into the infrastructure. And, and, and you know, again, talk to the charge network providers and, and, and look at the flexibility. We, we talked about how dynamic the industry is at the moment and it permeates all the way down to the, the suppliers 
of infrastructure as well. Mm. Great things happening. So I think it's a conversation that you really need to be having now with, with, with you know, DFM can help. Other lease companies should be able to help you. But let's get third party people involved in, in the initial meeting in terms of looking at how you can actually have a, a real um, joined up approach to electrification. Absolutely, because it's a community uh, activity, isn't it? We work collectively yeah, to bring forward the benefit. Yeah, and I think we know we're all in this together from manufacturer level through to a third party supplier network. It, it, it has to be joined up because actually we're, we're, we're all passionate about this together, aren't we? <laughs> you know, it, we, there's, there's people that get very excited about it yep. and they're from different strands of the industry. Um, but we ultimately we come and we, we're joined up with a message that now is the time to, to be looking. Now, all now is the time to be looking and now is the time to be doing. Right, so we're going to go to some questions. Uh, we've got a question here from Nigel Morris from the University of Swansea. Uh, Nigel has asked, how do you develop a consistent workplace staff and visitor EV charging user policy? Okay. Right. <laughs> How do you go about that? Because policy is all important. We've spoken uh, previously about people mm -hmm. being key mm. to making change happen. Right. Supporting those people with the right policies mm -hmm. is absolutely the most important thing you can do in taking people along on the journey to EVs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think absolutely. And I alluded in the webinar to two approaches, stick and carrot. And for <laughs> me, policy should always be around the carrot side of it to sell the benefits, quite honestly. Because if you're not buying into the benefits now, then you need a little bit of perhaps just a tweak in your, your approach to how you're going to implement this. And they are far reaching and they deal within any group of, of companies right into the very structure of what makes that company work. Mm -hmm. So I think a little bit needs to be thinking about the long-term benefits for you, your drivers, your local community, and instilling that within policy. And I think that it, it is a lot easier when it's carrot-based so that the incentives are obvious to everyone. But it's, I would, I would venture to suggest it's key that within an organisation, it's not just the fleet policy mm -hmm. that needs looking at. Right. But there's a whole horizontal integration piece that mm -hmm. needs to happen here, where you've got HR, finance, facilities, and yep. so on, yep. all looking at their policies at the same time. Do you get much involvement with other parts of the business other than just fleet managers? Well, I think if you're putting a, a really robust fleet policy in place, it's absolutely essential that all of those stakeholders are involved, mm. because you will always get HR who, who perhaps have the more emotive desires and finance are obviously going to be looking at the bottom line as well. Facilities want things to work. Yes. So when we implement any new project, and especially on electric vehicles, we try and bring all of the stakeholders in to that very first implementation meeting. And then we get it out on the table. What do you need from this project? What would you like from this project? And how can you help this project? Those three questions are vital because then you get stakeholder buy-in, yeah. and then your supply network buys in and understands the, the real nuances of how this new policy is going to work, yeah. long term and short term, and and ultimately, unless you have every single factor um, involved and ticked off by the stakeholders, it can fall down. So we like to get that commitment early doors, and and, and that's I think something that DFM is very good at in terms of implementing a really robust policy from the short term aims all the way through to the real long term game. It's DFM taking people on the journey. That's what we try and do. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got another question here from Jonathan Ayton from Wilmot Dixon. Jonathan asks, should we be imposing carbon grams per kilometre caps onto our cash allowance and Grey Fleet users? And just to explain, Grey Fleet, where people use their own vehicle on business miles. Mm -hmm. It's an area which Businesses tend not to focus too much on. Right, right. Could they do more? Well, it's grey for a reason, isn't it? Because it's <laughs> shrouded, often shrouded within mystery. But I think the ultimate answer to that is, if a vehicle is doing business work and incurring business miles, then why shouldn't you encourage that driver to be as green as possible? Mm. That's the simple short answer to that question. I think the longer term question is, it is going to be beneficial to the driver, hand in pocket, if they're doing business miles, you'll be paying them certain rates and it's going to be cheaper for you as a company to pay a rate in an electric vehicle than it is to an ICE engine. So I suppose flipping that on its head, what about incentivising mm -hmm. people to drive lower emission vehicles so right. you actually pay more yeah. 
for somebody who drives an electric vehicle mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. do it yep. than you do somebody who drives... That's, that's going back to the carrot again, isn't yeah. it? And, and I think that's really important because we need to be innovative now. Now is the time actually to be brave and to bring in policies like that which are perhaps going to incentivise drivers to think outside of the box. And if there's a choice and it's 50-50 whether you go for a hybrid or an electric vehicle, take the plunge, go full electric mm -hmm. if you can. So be brave. So the drivers need to be um, helped along that road as well. And uh, okay, educated might not be the right term to use, but why shouldn't we have a little bit of education in terms of that's going to help you pound in the pocket, that's going to help your environment, or your, your local street is going to be cleaner because of you. Yes. That's no bad thing, yeah. is it? Absolutely. If we can save a life, why we've not? done a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we've got a question here from Esther Coffin hyphenated Smith. <laughs> so thank you for that, uh, first hyphen of the day. Uh, what are the pitfalls to consider when setting up a carpool fleet for staff business mileage? So it develops right. that grey mm -hmm, fleet mm -hmm. thing that we're talking about yep. there. What do you think? What are the pitfalls? I think there's a number of issues to think about. And again, we talked about ergonomic routines of vehicles. Is that vehicle doing an A to A journey? Is it coming back to base? How many sites have you got that are linked up by a pool car fleet? Um, and ultimately, how many miles do you do? And, and what type of driving is it? Is it in a city? Is it some motorway driving so you get the right vehicles for the right task? That's pretty key, I think, John, because you allocate the right vehicle for the right journey, don't you? That's, a, that's an obvious Absolutely. one. And from an electric point of view, if you're having short stop, stops, um, you want to think about charging as well overnight, potentially. So that A to A, you know, starts here, comes back here after doing two or three stops and then charges. Then you're getting the actual profile of the fleet, yes. you know, nicely nicely wrapped up so you can make the right decisions. And I think the other thing is just, just try and be flexible in the way that you approach these, these, these things because yes. pool car fleets sometimes can replace company cars or they can replace individual cars for the driver. Let's make it easy for them to use because I've seen too many pool car fleets that sit there yes. and they aren't utilised properly yes. because there's another way um, that's easier or because they've always done it that way. And, and again, the carrot way of saying to drivers, you've got some great cars on that pool car fleet, please use it, it's gonna save us money, ultimately it will save you money. It's gotta be a way forward. Yeah, absolutely, I heard a great phrase the other day or saying, which was, if you want to go green, you have to stop seeing the world in black and white. Okay, right, right. And I think that's absolutely right. And let's throw into the mix that if you add black and white together, you make grey. Okay, yeah, so. well, you know, <laughs> so you, you, you've got that back nicely to grey fleet management because yeah, it's, it's a great point. Again, it goes back to being being brave and being colourful. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's really have now is the time to make this move. When we talked about how dynamic the industry is earlier, I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time for electric vehicles mm -hmm. at the moment. It's only going to get more exciting, it, just in terms of choice mm -hmm. and in terms of the accessibility and the availability. So yeah, let, let's let's be colourful. Let's be brave in the way that we actually approach things like um, grey fleet and pool car fleets because. Um, there's some great solutions there. Now we're, we're both evangelists for mm -hmm. electric vehicles, yep. but it's fair to say that electric vehicles are not right for everyone just yet, no. are they? No, they're not. And, and again, I alluded to the LCV market as well, because you have range to take into account, you have journeys, you have the weight of what's being carried. It's not a silver bullet electric vehicles, but the, now is the time to think about actually replacing those vehicles that can be replaced. Yes. And I talk about those vehicles that are the no-brainers. You know, why not replace those first and then think longer term as um, the OEMs bring in models of better range, for example, and legislation changes to actually help uh, the process being decided on. So no, I never ever advocate you know changing that fleet to, to electric straight away because. It can't happen, can it? You know, you have to look at horses for courses and fit the electric vehicles into the slots where they are actually going to do what they're meant to do. Yeah, because the number one priority is always getting the job done. Get the job done, get the driver from A to B, get the product from, from A to B yeah. um, quickly, efficiently, and in a cost-effective manner as mm, well. Yeah, so. now, we've got a question here about could we potentially have a scrappage scheme? Mm -hmm. Because this is one of the key areas that government have used before mm -hmm. to remove vehicles mm -hmm. from, from the public fleet. Yeah, and successfully. Potentially business fleet. Yeah. And whether we could extend a scrappage scheme into mobility credits. Right, right. Do you think that that's something that would work? So w what we mean by that is if you're undertaking grey fleet miles currently in your own personal vehicle, mm. 
could you be credited for scrapping your own vehicle mm. and given tokens, vouchers, whatever, to use on public transport for official business? Right, yeah, well, I think that goes back to, again, being creative. And I think we need to push for areas of any, any reason that you can give a driver to think about an alternative to the journey has got to be worth looking into. And if it means that a driver is going to hop on a bus, now that could be a local policeman. Yes. You know, on, on, yes. You know he's, he's got a, a beat meeting and instead of taking that car out, he's going to go a mile and a half down the road on a bus and then the local police force get a credit back in whichever way, shape or form. Sounds odd, policeman on the bus, but why not? Yeah. You yeah. know, again, we, we just have to be innovative. And I think any notion of um, helping people along the lines to thinking, right, is there, is there a fiscal benefit for me doing this? If the answer is yes, explore it. Yeah, and absolutely. then you look at the logistics behind it. So again, it all goes back to being creative and, and, and being brave. Yeah, and you're both creative and brave? I hope so. Top man. <laughs> right, now we've got some live questions here. Uh, Paul Gogolinski uh, has sent in a question. One of the greatest challenges I see is the stability and predictability of residual values. As we move forward and vehicle ranges increase, will this not impact previous model RVs more significantly? What's the current experience in this respect, Paul? Right. Bless you for your question. Good question. Go for it. Okay. RVs. Uh, well, again, in the webinar, I mentioned the fact that I think lease companies are cottoning onto this, and certainly we are at DFM about shorter term leasing. And I think if you look at the traditional whole life cost, you'll see four and five years beginning to work on a lot of cars and LCVs now. And we're actually advocating on the electric vehicle side, looking at two years. Right. Because then that, with new technology coming in, you're not left with a lease to run for two years where that vehicle's already been superseded in terms of the range and, and, and what can happen. Yeah. Again, it goes back to flexibility. We're even looking at swapping out of vehicles in a four-year lease, so that a four-year lease actually encompasses two vehicles. So again, you stay ahead of the technology. And I think it's all about flexibility. Now, one of the things we will see in terms of residual values potentially is downloads, software downloads actually yes. into the car. Yeah. So that car is changing over the course of the three or four year lease. We're already seeing it with Tesla. Yes. So the vehicle you step into in week one of a four year lease isn't the vehicle that's handed back. And for the lease company, we need to work out where that end game is in terms of the end residual value. It's not easy. But again, if you're creative and you're brave, yes. you'll come up with a solution. And I think we've come up with a solution that's, that's twofold. A, it's, it's a residual value that's robust yet sustainable, and B, the flexibility to move around in a lease so that you don't feel trapped on a vehicle that all of a sudden becomes obsolete. Mm. And a lot of the public sector still buy their vehicles mm -hmm. outright, don't mm -hmm. they? They just hand over a lump of cash yep. and say, yeah, thanks yep. ever so much, I like that. Yep. Um, and I, th I have always thought that leasing mm -hmm. de-risks the proposition for businesses right. and for the public sector yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. you carry that risk. Yes, mm -hmm. they pay a premium sure. for it through yep. leasing costs, but ultimately you're not left with something that isn't fit for purpose. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. And I think if you do buy, then you need to look at the flexibility of the vehicle in terms of taking on a second life, mm. doing a different job. And we, we often find this with blue light where a vehicle is no longer doing that, that rapid response work and perhaps is, is put into patient transport, for yes. example. Yes. So if you do buy, you need to think about the longevity of the vehicle as well. I think you're right, um, you know, leasing does negate that risk because we take on mm. that risk. Having said that, I'd rather advocate um, a, a council, for example, buying an electric vehicle than no electric vehicles Indeed. at all. Indeed. And, and it is horses for courses. If that's the way that you've always gone in terms of making um, an electric vehicle stack up because you can draw down funds that are cost effective, go ahead and do it. If you want to talk to a lease company about shorter term leasing because you want that flexibility, that option is also there. Yeah. Yeah, it's just make the change, mm. whichever way you yeah, have to. Exactly. Now then, we've got Anne O'Driscoll. Anne, thank you. Uh, the road to zero seems to ignore that we need to reduce vehicle use. Absolutely. Uh, we had two of the crew here today who uh, really struggled. They've taken four hours to get from Leicester into London. Utter nonsense. And the real problem here is that we've just got too many vehicles the right. on the road. Absolutely. How do we deal with congestion? It might seem counterintuitive for a lease company to say that there needs to be less vehicles on the road, but believe me, we, 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 we do honestly uh, advocate that. Um, you just need to think and plan ahead. I think planning is essential. There's no way I would have driven to the Oval today because I'm lucky I've got a good train line. Yeah. You, why, why wouldn't you use it? And I think um, 
if, if we'd been at another location, I might have considered driving as yeah. well. So, so plan ahead, look at, telematics is a great help with this, journey planning is essential. And Anne's absolutely right, let's get less vehicles on the road and think about mobility solutions that will come in time. I think for the time being, we have to think about the fact that as a nation, we love our vehicles and we are always gonna to want to have them on the road. So let's drive cleaner vehicles. Yeah. Perhaps it's gonna be a generational change whereby um, our children just go, I don't need a car, John. And we'll look at alternatives or I'm gonna have a car only when necessary and I'll hop into a car club. And I think these, these ways of looking at keeping vehicles off the road in yes. key, Key, key times when, when there's gridlock has is, is got to be something we think about long term. And, and I think that, that comes back to government and walking and cycling and in London as we've experienced yep. here today, yep. the number of cyclists mm. uh, in special protected cycle lanes yep. is absolutely superb and really helps us yeah, you've got to, to get those vehicles off the road. You've got to make it easy for people <clears throat> and again it's got to be carrot based and, yep. and however we, we might like being in a vehicle <laughs> There has to be a bit of responsibility on our part just yeah. to say no as well. Yeah. I am going to look to take the bus, I'm going to look to take the tube today. Or well, do you know what, I'm just going to walk that mile and a half to yes. work. Yeah. I mean we both got a little bit moist this morning. We got very wet but it was worth it, so uh, no complaints. Because we walked. We used public transport and we walked. You have to make hard choices. Those hard choices are best made with data, with analysis, with understanding, with knowledge. Once you've got that knowledge, having trusted friends like DFM mm -hmm. is really important to then make the right choices for you. There is no single silver bullet, as you've no. said, no. and I think it's really important that people who have the responsibility need to exercise their authority and make the changes that are necessary to clean and green our fleets. Simon, thank you so much thank for being you, here today. It's been, a pleasure. it's been utterly stunning. Uh, we want to do so many more of these, and thank you everybody for uh, coming along, for listening to the webinar, seeing what DFM have to offer. Uh, if you have liked what we've done today, I'm John Curtis. If you haven't, I'm Jeremy Clarkson. Goodbye. Goodbye.